Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It's a beautiful day in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yes. Guys, have you noticed something? I don't know about you, but ever since I was a teenager, I have realized that the world loves to judge. Anybody remember being a teenager and getting judged and judging other people? You know, uh, there was the cool crowd, which I wasn't a part of. <laughs> there was the nerdy crowd, which had kind of could geek out a little bit. And then there was the, you know, kind of the roughnecks, the long hair, concert t-shirts, bananas. Well, it was the 80s that I was a part of. But we all do that, don't we? We all judge, we, and, and we get judged. Watching the TV the other day, and I realized that, that there is... Game shows, all about judging. America's Got Talent. Anybody watch America's Got Talent? Yeah. Simon can be kind of harsh. But he's usually right. And then right now they're into the uh, finals where America gets to decide what is considered a good music or good entertainment. And America doesn't always get it right. But you know what? That same attitude of judging permeates the people of God. And this morning I want us to look at the kind of the final section of the Sermon on the Mount that I've been working through is how it starts with this great call to being a merciful community, not one of judgment of the world, but of maybe judgment of ourselves. And looking at us and how to be merciful to each other. But first, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. And may you open our minds to understand it. Give us ears to hear, a heart to understand, and the abilities to apply it. Lord, sometimes it is hard to understand your word, but we know you can guide us and will be. Inspire us this morning, Lord, and may these words that I have prepared be pleasing to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measures you give, will be measures you get. Why do you set, see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but, not, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Oh, how can you say to your neighbor, let me take out the speck of your eye, well, the log is in your own. You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I think a lot of times today in the world, we, we, this is used, the scripture is used, for Christians trying to judge the world. The, the world, non-Christians, non-believers, know this scripture very well. They use it to us all the time. And I think they might be right. This scripture really is the one about judging the self, the, the righteousness of people outside the world. We're not to do that. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, For what have I to do with judging those outside? And the question should be nothing. It is not those who are inside that you are to judge. God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. You see, right there, God is the only one that can judge someone's salvation. God judges their attitudes of their heart. Now, once we become a Christian, once we become a follower of, as Dr. Craig said, the way, then we are to really begin to look at ourselves and the people that we are a part of. And to hold ourselves accountable. That's what the scripture is talking about. That we are to be called to a self-examination and accountability. We can tell the world what, what is all wrong with them. And get, don't get me going. It is wrong. And I have people who live those lifestyles. But at the same time, as Dr. Craig is teaching about, we have created 
the system of church. That is also false. How can we tell the world about Jesus and the Messiah if we're following something else? So this is for us to start talking to, looking at ourselves. And remember, Jesus is giving this sermon to his disciples. People who have lived and taught, been taught the ways of the oral law and the written law and all of those things. And they're sitting there and he's teaching them something new and deeper and powerful. And that law is the oral law. So he's asking us to remove those things, remove those traditions of men, remove the things that we don't do right before we tell others. And that's merciful. Think about it. Being judged is pretty hard, isn't it? Especially when you're not judging yourself. I, I get frustrated when I'm driving down the road and somebody comes barreling past me. Do it while I was speaking. And it's funny. Usually I'm the one doing the barrel. <laughs> my grandkid said that to me. My, one of my grandsons said that one day. He said, Bob, why are you mad at them? They're just going faster than you are. <laughs> that's kind of, that's not right. So I've been trying to follow the speed limit. Plus I don't want insurance to go up. But I was judging someone <laughs> while I was doing the same thing. I don't know about you, but I talk about people and, and, and how, how they're not living up to the things of God. But I don't know this little. So Jesus has told us, start with yourselves. And Paul even goes on to say that when we judge people inside the church, and there are things that go on inside the church that are not right. Immorality in the church today, in the world today, is as rampant as the world. And we're to drive those people out. Now, there's, when we'll look at it here in the, in the next little bit, there's ways to do that. One of the first things we need to see here in verse 6 is you do, do not give what is holy to the dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under foot and turn and maul you. To me that talks about exercising discretion. We're not to force the work of God on those who will not receive. Not only worldly people, <coughs> but church people. You know, there's a whole group of people who think they know the Bible better than everybody else. And they're not going to listen to you when it comes to the idea of correction. And we know that that's what Scripture is there for, is for training and reproof and correction. So you've got to be careful and discern who you're going to talk to. Now, Matthew 18 tells us how to do that. <coughs> Turn with me to Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Because we need to, all right? We do need to have a pure, holy body. We need to be able to reprove those who are sinning. But we first make sure that we are in the right way. It says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Simplest way to correction, one-on-one. -on -one. If you got a problem with someone, don't bring it to the preacher, don't bring it to the pastor, don't bring it to your wife, your husband. If you got a problem, take it straight to the person first. Maybe it's just a misunderstanding. Especially with Facebook. Facebook drama causes more problems within the church and within our own personal lives. So don't hear anything on Facebook. Go to the person directly. Now, if the member listens to you, you've regained that one. Isn't there something joyous when you sit down and talk with someone and you realize it was just a simple misunderstanding? Mm -hmm. Or that even when if, it's, if it's a major sin, they may not realize they're doing it. I mean, in this day and age, the stuff that's taught in the church, somebody may not know that that's against the words of God or that's against the laws of God. How many people today in the church know that the Sabbath 
It's Friday night to Saturday. Because the church, which I was a part of for 25 years, says, oh, this is a Sabbath. It's not. Sunday's the Lord's Day. Whatever you want to call it, it's not. Today is a Sabbath. Most people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So when you sit down and talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, you, you might bring them in there and you get this great feeling of restored relationships. And to, but if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If a member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen, even in the church, let such one be to you as a Gentile and a tax. Mm -hmm. Now think about this. Someone is teaching doctrine Someone is doing something that is against the laws of God, as, as Dr. Craig has been teaching. <coughs> you go to them, they don't listen. You grab a couple of other loving Christian brothers or sisters, and you come and you talk to them. And then they still refuse to listen. There is a thing you do. You treat them as a Gentile tax collector. Now, that's harsh. But I will tell you, tough love sometimes is the best type of love. How else did anybody do tough love with their children? I mean, sorry, kids. <laughs> yeah, he's experienced it. it. This is not right. You're going to be not in a great relationship with mom and dad. The same thing with the church. Now, what does it mean to be treated as a Gentile tax collector? It doesn't always mean you just quit talking to them, but you start praying for them. They may not get to the intimate fellowships of the church and some of those things, but you pray for them and you keep praying for them. Because we know God is the one that convicts. But you have to discern what is important, what is in the Word of God, and how to do this. Go back to the other. Turn with me back to Matthew 7. It goes on to a call for us in chapter 7 to have this merciful community, one that is holy, one that is just, and one that draws people. There has to be a call to continuous and consistent discipleship. Chapter 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. If there's any among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if a child asks for fish, will you give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? This, some translations look at it as keep seeking, Keep asking, keep knocking. Now, this isn't for a new car, okay? This is about knowing the things of God. About the laws of God and how they're to apply. And you keep on, even when your human mind, your fleshly mind, your carnal mind might not understand. Because if you keep seeking, and you keep asking, and you knock on that door, you will eventually, I guarantee you we're all on a journey. I, I, I look at these little kids. They don't know now what it means to be an adult and pay taxes. Because they're children. Over time, they'll learn. They'll learn what it's like to go to school, take tests, face peer pressure. They'll know what it's like to have to pay bills. But they're not there. But they're going to keep growing in maturity. That's what this talks about. is a continued growth in maturity. You don't just say a prayer. You don't just say anything and then go, okay, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> because if you do, you miss something so important. You miss out on the joy of a deep abiding relationship. How many of y'all been, how many of y'all been married more than 30 seconds? Yeah. Or been in a relationship more than two seconds? <laughs> you have to know that you don't just go and say, hey, we're going out. And then all of a sudden you're married, and all of a sudden, no problem. See you, honey. 
and not spend any time with that spouse. If you do, I promise you, you're not going to have a great strong marriage. You're actually not going to have a marriage at all. But you'll have to keep seeking out that relationship, doing all that you can, even when it's hard. And I think that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. Keep on keeping on. Keep on looking, keep on asking, keep on delving into the scripture, because then you're going to find a well of truth. And this idea, it, this, and what he's really talking about is this indiscriminate love for all people. Look at verse 12, it says, If everything, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and prophets. Very simple to con Sums up, Jesus sums it up too, to, to, to do what? Love the Lord your God by your heart, soul, mind, and body, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's an indiscriminate type of love that is merciful to the world and to other brothers and sisters in the faith. To think for a moment, what do you see about <coughs> the church of God today in this world? We don't treat our neighbors as ourselves. We, we judge them. We judge them when that's God's job. What if we love those people in that store, even when they're most unlovable? I will tell you, when I came to know the Lord, I was most unlovable. And there are days today, and my wife will tell you, I can be most unlovable. <laughs> I am still judgmental, getting better each day. I am still stubborn and hard-headed. But somebody loved me enough to tell me about God in life by showing me that love, exhibiting that love. When I wanted to hit the guy because he gave me a hug, he backed up, waited until I felt more of When I kicked him the side of my car because he stole my cigarettes <laughs> and was ready to throw them because I, I, I was going through an addiction withdrawal, they kept coming back. They kept praying. They kept showing me the love of God. And eventually, eventually, I accepted that love. And that really is the goal of the world, To love the neighbors as themselves. And that's a call to something that's really radical today. It's countercultural. This, this whole idea that Jesus is talking about, the Sermon on the Mount, is going to be countercultural to the church of God in America today because they're more worried about their coffee houses in their church, their bookstores in their church, their rock bands in their church. None of those things in and of themselves is wrong. It was when it becomes the focus of the church. But they're not loving. I look at, we have mega churches around Johnson City and Kingsport and all over. A lot of mega churches. A lot of big churches. And yet, I don't see it changing the culture. For us to really change culture, we have to love our neighbors. We have to follow the golden rule. And do unto others. Treat others the way we want to be treated. Now, we're also called to a hard Road. Discipleship, true discipleship is never easy. I'm going to steal the Marine Corps symbol here, motto, the few, the proud, the Marines. Not everybody can become a Marine because you have to go through 13 weeks of utter terror, horror, physical stuff. I didn't, I knew I couldn't do it, didn't do it. Joined the middle Air Force, a little bit easier. But the call to Christian discipleship is this. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. There are few who find it. I want Dr. Craig to leave this up here because if you take a look, this road, there's, there's no boundaries. Just open this road, he drew boundaries. You enter this narrow gate through the idea of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. That's a little bit more narrow. There are some rules and there are some things. 
in the law of God that we should be following. Because they're good for us. And they're what God said now. Let's take a look at the Sabbath. You go tell someone today that the Sabbath is Saturday and that you're going to take the Sabbath day off work because it's truly the Sabbath, you're going to get laughed at. And be told, uh, you, you got a new job. You can go find a new job. Because to the world, it's silly. They've been taught that it's Sunday and everything's set up for Sunday. But if you're following the law of God, that's going to be hard. You might have to sacrifice. Yeah. Might have to give up, baby. You're starting to convict me now. <laughs> <laughs> I like my bacon. <laughs> but see, I, I've been doing this a lot of years, and I'm just starting to get deeper into certain things. Because the true discipleship of is worth it in the end. Those guys... In the middle of when you're a veteran, there's three things. You're former Air Force, former Army, former Navy. If you talk to a Marine, I don't care if it's been 60 years. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah, that's what it says. Because what they went through. Once that, and that's the kind of attitude we need to have in our discipleship. Because this was worth it. It's not easy. Because you are going to face with the truth, you're all going to face judgment. The narrow is that game. We also have to be again, we're also called to be weary, weary and leery of people. Verse 15 says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns? Are our figs from thistles? Is the same way, in the same way, every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruits, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then you will know them by their fruits. Jesus really is talking us to be leery of different people who are coming. In his time, there would be Judaizers. People who are trying to take the way back to the oral law. Today, it might be people who are trying to get us to only be on Sunday, not worry about these rules. There are, that's where discernment and we leery, being leery of people who are teaching the words of God. Leery of people who call themselves Christians. Take a look at someone's life. Are they themselves growing? Now, I'm not saying everybody's perfect, because I'm far from it. But are they delving into the Word of God and learning and growing and getting and being more convicted of new things that they're teaching, like what we're learning at Sabbath school? Amen. If they're not, they'd be leery. Like Dr. Craig said at the last go home read your Bible. Let God, let God show you the way. Now, not only are we to be curious about leery about teachers and false prophets, but the last one, he kind of closes this section. He said, not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of, a, of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name, and do many deeds of power in your name. Then I will turn to declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone who, everyone then who hears the word of mine and acts on it will be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who bears, hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house in sand. The rains fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell 
and great was the fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were assembled at his teaching, or were astounded at his teaching, for he taught with one having authority, not as the scribes. House built on the rock. House built on the sand. We have to not only worry about prophets who are coming into teaching, but we also have to look at our own selves. We have to deceive. We have to go past that self-deception. Anybody here think they can deceive themselves? <laughs> I'm sorry. I believe my own stuff. <laughs> I can tell myself that that pal's hamburger, the junior one that I'm running past to get because I didn't have a chance to get lunch, is okay because it's a junior burger. <laughs> well, not so much. <laughs> it does not, time does not lie. I lie to myself because it feels good. Same thing for people. There's going to be many people who say, hey, Jesus, I went and I built a, I built a stadium in Texas, and I filled it with a bunch of people. And I, 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 I had my own plane. And I flew over here to teach these great things of God. And he's going to say, apart from me, didn't know. Because you weren't teaching the right things. You didn't have the right action. Well, Lord, we saw healings and we saw these things and we had these great big revivals throughout all of the world for 20 and 30 years. Apart from Be careful of your own self-deception. We need to worry about the people and what they're teaching us and what we're receiving in. And we also have to be into the Word of God and let the Word of God change us. Even when it's hard to hear. And when it's... We, we, in my line of work, we always ask each other the challenge. They'll say, I, I, I want to ask you about a question. It's something I'm struggling with. And we're like, okay, do you want feedback? How do I know you're going to get feedback? And I'm like, I always tell people, how, how honest do you want me to be with you? <laughs> you want me to be 100% honest? And, and, and a few times my bosses have said yes. And then when I told them, I'm not working here anymore. <laughs> Had to leave about a year ago. <laughs> because I kept telling my boss what he wanted, what he asked me. But I didn't tell him the way he wanted to hear it. And I didn't tell him what he really wanted to hear. We do that to ourselves. So be careful. Be careful what you're telling yourself about your walk with Christ. The Holy Spirit will inspire you when you're in the book. This the scripture is inspired by God for correction, for teaching, for rebuking. This and the Holy Spirit will guide us. Because that is the biggest thing. To me, that's the biggest thing. And we need to be hearers and doers of the Word. Because that's where it's at. Eleven people, fifty years in the Old Testament changed the world. Millions of people came to Christ, affected everything around it. <coughs> everything around it. Imagine today if the people of God were hooked into the power of God yeah. through the law of God. The world around us would change. But it starts first with me and with you. That's the call to discipleship. And in summary, that's really the whole teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. A call to radical discipleship. Radical love, radical commitment, countercultural to the easy ways of American life. Are you ready? Have you accepted the call? God's life. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us each to be hearers and doers of the word. May we act on that.
maybe we might be like wise people and build our house on the rock, on you, on the truth that you are Yeshua, Messiah, the atoning sacrifice.